but yeah, I do post stuff uh, there, and I'll, I'll reiterate that to you guys. Uh, welcome to the uh, third meeting of the semester of uh, Controversies in Church History. Uh, tonight, the topic we're discussing is the doctrine of papal infallibility, uh, as defined by the First Vatican Council. Um, you, guys, you guys probably all know about Vatican II. You grew up probably hearing about it uh, at your age, but uh, there was a first one. Uh, the first one took place in 1869, 1870. Uh, and it is the council that actually formally defined, for the first time, uh, what the Pope's powers were uh, regard, with regard to the Catholic Church. And so I want to talk about today, it was, this is a really controversial event at the time, and still kind of is for a variety of reasons. And so we're going to give you a, a little background of this tonight, um, uh, as good as I can, having forgotten my notes. Um, and so the first thing uh, I talked about here, I was going to give you, <laughs> before I had forgotten my notes, bring my notes with me, the definition that they actually um, create in 1870 when they formally define as a dogma uh, of the Catholic Church. Uh, by the way, that name, Pastor Eternus, is the dogmatic constitution that the council actually promulgates uh, in July of 1870. And uh, it means eternal shepherd, if you don't know what that means. And I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, but it goes something like that. By the way, you can, if you have your phones out, you can look it up on the internet. It is, all the stuff is available, but essentially the documents of the council on the internet. That, um, when the pontiff of Rome uh, defines a doctrine ex cathedra, that is to say, when he invokes his solemn authority to define a doctrine that is believed by the entire church, right? when he's defining a doctrine that will be defined by the entire church, uh, invoking the guidance you know, uh, of his you know, uh, petrine authority uh, coming from St. Peter, um, that said doctrine is uh, basically going to be promulgated infallibly, that is to say, without basically failing for infallible means. Um, even if, and they actually include this uh, fairly controversial phrase in the document, even without the consent of the church, that is to say the Pope can do this all on his own, without the consent of the council, without the consent of his bishops, if need be. Uh, and so that's the basic, uh, and again, I wish I had the actual document at my disposal, I had it in my notes. Um, but the key term there, by the way, is ex cathedra. When he speaks ex cathedra, um, he speaks infallibly. So what does this mean, first of all? Um, this means, first of all, well, I was going to tell this good story. You may have actually read this, and you should if you haven't read this. Uh, there are some people that make, think this means something like, um, has anyone here actually read uh, Brides Ever Visited? I don't know if you haven't read it. You should read the novel. Anyway, novel by Evelyn Law. Uh, at one point in this novel, uh, one of the characters is getting married through the flights, who's a Catholic, to a non-practicing Protestant named Max Mottram. So she has him meet the family uh, family priest, basically. It's an aristocratic thing where they have a family priest, it's a thing. Um, and so she, he goes in to like, give him some sort of you know, religious instruction. And he asks him, um, he says to uh, Rex Mottram, the priest, of, I can't remember his name, I'm not having it in my notes, uh, and says, um, how many natures does Christ have? And by the way, if you guys don't know that, he has two natures, divine and human, that's a fairly basic thing. Uh, and so Rex Mottram says, well, just as many natures as you say, Father. So the priest tries again and says, okay, if the Pope looks at the sky and sees a cloud and says, it's definitely going to rain now, does that mean it's going to rain? Rex Mottram says to him, well, uh, of course, Father. And then the priest says, well, what if it doesn't actually rain? And Rex Mottram sits there for a second and says, well, I suppose it's just spiritually raining. We're too simple to see it then. Uh, and the pun <laughs> pun funny story was to make fun of Rex Mottram, not knowing anything about of course, the Catholic Church, and what that means, um, what the Pope's infallibility amounts to. And uh, I think that one of the reasons I wanted to uh, give this topic or talk about this topic was to explain what it means to speak infallibly, uh, what type of um, authority the Pope has in that regard. And I can assure you it doesn't mean that. <laughs> the Pope can't just say whatever he wants and have to be taken as true. Um, we'll come back to this at the end of this, but. Um, and I also wanted to go through the historical background to why this was defined in 1870. Uh, because, as you, as you know, the Catholic Church for a long, long time before this, actually going back many centuries, has proclaimed um, as a tradition that the Pope is actually infallible. This is much older than 1870. The question becomes, well, why was it only defined in 1870? If you don't know, of course, the, there are, of course, biblical texts. Uh, Matthew 16, 18, uh, or is it 18, 16? I can't remember which one. Uh, again, I had it in my notes. Uh, where, of course, Christ says to um, uh, 
Saint Peter, Saint Simon Peter. You are uh, Peter. I was brought up in my church. Uh, there are other passages in the New Testament which seem to indicate his authority. From that, in a much later period, you have the development of his doctrine. The Pope has basically two types of authority in the church. One, his primacy. That is to say, he is the sort of leader or head of the church on earth. The second one is he has a teaching authority. This is where infallibility comes from. And um, by the time you get to the late Middle Ages, it's actually a fairly well-developed doctrine, even though it's never been defined. Uh, it gets attacked um, by the Protestant Reformation. That's one of the big things that it attacks. Yet it's still, the church did not see, see fit or bother to define it. So the question becomes, why in 1870? I want to talk about that especially because I think it's important for us to know. And then finally, I'm going to come back to this at the end, as we've already kind of mentioned. What does all this mean for you? What are you obliged to believe of uh, what the Pope says it and why and what conditions? Um, and again, I wish I'd had my notes to be a little more specific, but again, the general uh, breakdown of what you can uh, take away from this, uh, apologetically speaking. So that's my little introduction uh, from Pastor Paternus. And I kind of want to tell this story, by the way, of the council uh, through the eyes of two people. Because we're talking about the 19th century here. And um, there really are a couple of people who are kind of, not direct antagonists, but they kind of embody the two contrasting um, social and theological uh, impulses at play in the First Vatican Council. And the first one is Blessed Pius IX, uh, who was Pope from 1846 uh, to 1878, uh, born much earlier than that, obviously. And um, he is uh, kind of a controversial figure to this day for a lot of different reasons. The main reason being he's the pope most associated in the 19th century with the church's pushback against, well, modern civilization, let's put it that way. Um, one of the main things known about his life, he's born in 1792, he's born during the French Revolution in Europe. You remember about the French Revolution, they were sort of monarchy in, uh, in France, they were the church in France. Uh, and the revolution does several things. It spreads you know, enlightenment ideas of individualism, individual rights, those sorts of things. Um, it also spreads ideas like nationalism, uh, which are very powerful in the 19th century, especially in places like, we'll get to this in a moment, Germany and Italy, who have really well-developed cultural traditions, but they're not politically unified. And so it will spur, you know, not just the French Revolution, but Napoleon Bonaparte, who becomes dictator at the end of this uh, process, uh, will invade places like Italy and Germany, and he will put his stamp on these countries, introducing Enlightenment-inspired laws, things of this nature, religious arrangements, where you have you know, uh, Catholicism on a par with Jews and Protestants that hadn't been before in these Catholic countries. Um, and what will happen, and I'm generalizing um, in a big way here, but there's going to be a reaction to this uh, once the revolutionary fervor dies down, once Napoleon is defeated. In 1815, he's defeated at the Battle of Waterloo. Monarchies are restored after 1815. There's a sort of um, revival of a more we'll counter-enlightenment Catholicism, more emphasis on um, uh, pious devotion, more emphasis on emotion, if you like, throughout Catholic Europe, and uh, a rejection in some ways of a lot of the main thrusts, not all of them, of, uh, of the revolution. And this is one of the things to know about Pius IX is he grows up in the background of all of this. Um, it's never far from his thoughts in a lot of ways. And partly because, of course, the church suffered uh, horribly in these wars. It lost, you know, property was taken from it in the name of the people of France, in the name of the nation, and stuff like this, stuff it never got back. Um, and uh, in many ways, again, this is what's going on in the background of defining this council. But in fact, Pius IX, uh, when, he came to, uh, when he actually came, uh, he became Pope in 1846, was considered to be friendly to liberalism. I need to define liberalism very quickly here for you. I don't mean modern liberals in the modern Democratic Party, in favor of the state and all that. Liberalism in the 19th century essentially meant classical liberalism, if you know what that is. People who favor you know, individual rights, a small state, all those sorts of things. Um, what they favored was freedom from authorities like kings, popes, stuff like this. Um, they didn't want to get into the tutelage of you know, feudal powers or anything like that. Self-government was the big thing motivating a lot of liberals in the 19th century. <clears throat> and there were a lot of them in Italy. They actually had a high opinion of Pius uh, before he became pope. Uh, Pius, by the way, uh, part of the reason they did, I should mention this, I don't have a map here to show you, I mentioned Italy was not one unified country. There were lots of different states at this time in the 1830s. Um, the Austrian Empire actually governs part of northern Italy. 
They actually, um, uh, there was actually a rebellion against them in the 1830s. Uh, one of the armies that were fighting against the Austrians had to flee to the city of which Pius IX was the bishop. Uh, and he managed to get those rebels to lay down their arms and then interceded for them to the Austrian commander and got them off the hook. This is one of the reasons why he had a good reputation among liberals. Um, he wasn't a liberal, by the way. <laughs> uh, actually, he was sympathetic to political liberalism. I should put it in those terms. This is one of the things, by the way, it's actually a big flashpoint uh, in this debate. Keep in the back of your mind. I'm going to talk about theological stuff as much as I can because it'll interest me. I think it's important for us. But a lot of the controversy about uh, papal infallibility has to do with the church and its authority vis-a-vis the state. There are a lot of people who hate the church mainly because they don't like the idea of anybody telling them what to do <laughs> in the 19th century. This is the great age of democratic revolutions. People are establishing for the first time self-government in their countries. And I should mention as well, the Pope in the 19th century until 1870 has his own state. He has the papal states. He is a, a temporal monarch as well as a, a religious figure as well. Uh, one thing I have to mention in passing is too interesting not to. Pius IX, as you see there, was also an epileptic. Apparently early in his life, uh, before he became a priest, he actually, I guess, I can't remember the name of the, uh, um, what shrine he prayed at to the Virgin, I think the Virgin of Spoleto, that was his bishop, uh, city he was a bishop of. Apparently cured him of this uh, until, the second, uh, until the Vatican Council, they, the Pepilitic fix came back. Um, it's interesting to note about the man that he was an epileptic originally. His uh, reputation for liberalism didn't last long. In 1848, there was a series of revolutions across Europe, uh, so they sometimes called the spring times of the peoples, because this was, these were popular revolts against these monarchies, which in the post-revolution period, you had monarchies restored. Some of them had eh, not absolute powers, but they, feel they were uh, monarchies and uh, still real, real monarchies, not figureheads. Uh, starts in Paris, spreads to the rest of Europe, gets to Rome where um, eventually Pius, who had been fairly favorable to it, uh, suddenly changed his tune. Why did he change his tune? Uh, because the rebels actually chased him out of Rome and killed one of his, uh, I believe it was his governor of Rome, assassinated him and made him flee for his life. Uh, eventually the French army, once it had put down <laughs> the rebellion in France in 1850, came back and restored the Pope uh, to his throne in uh, Rome. And this is the end of Pius being in any way uh, friendly to liberalism, political or otherwise, basically. And so from 1850 onwards, the last 20, nearly 30 years of his reign, by the way, Pius is also the longest reigning uh, pope in history, 32 years, uh, more than John Paul II. Uh, he will dedicate the rest of his pontificate to opposing what he takes to be um, errors in modern thinking, in particular errors that having to do with things like rationalism, atheism, materialism. Um, in fact, he issued one on the before. 1848 about this, even before the uh, revolution of 1848. In particular, the two most notorious things he issues are uh, the syllabus of errors and a quanta cura, which was one of his encyclicals in 1864, where again, he's going to assert um, a lot of things that I think are very important about um, the threat from modern ideas. It's most notorious because he condemns things like, well, democracy. Uh, he condemns things like uh, religious freedom, those sorts of things, as being incompatible with the yeah, idea that the church is the one true church, basically. Um, so he gets a bad reputation. He has a very bad reputation among liberals. I'm, all, I'm not going to lie to you. I really think Pius IX is one of my heroes, actually, for a lot of different reasons. I think he was a really uh, providential figure in some ways. Um, I should mention this because his concern actually is wider than politics, uh, much wider, actually. Uh, one of the things he's very concerned about is the credibility, if you like, of the church and its teachings. Because one of the things that you have, Protestant, you know, Enlightenment, secular figures, criticizing the church for, we'll come back to this in a moment, in the late 19th century, is that, well, its doctrines have changed so much over time. The variations in church teaching mean that, well, it must not be, uh, the church is making, making things up as it goes along, essentially. It's an accusation, of course, you can make when it's that old. An institution, you know, goes through a lot of changes over time. Uh, but it's something I to keep in mind, I'll come back to this, I think he wants to respond to, uh, even if he doesn't always articulate that very clearly. But he's certainly concerned about um, the effects that these ideas from the French Revolution have on people's faith. And then finally, Pius, and this is the other part of his and why he's controversial, is that he fights to the last instant against the resor uh, last instance against the Risorgimento. And the Risorgimento is the drive to unify Italy. Um, after he's put back in the throne in 1850, the forces of revolution, and by the way, there are several different monarchies who are involved in this, but 
uh, actually two people, Giuseppe Mazzini and I believe it's Giuseppe Garibaldi, both Josephs. Uh, Garibaldi are the troops who, they're sort of insurgent troops who are trying to, again, push the other kingdoms of Italy to uh, unify, the, uh, unify uh, Italy into one state, which they do in 1861. They actually get the Kingdom of Naples, brings together basically every state except for parts of the Papal States uh, in 1861. Uh, leaving the Papal States the last sort of territory not to be incorporated into the Italian state. It's honestly only a matter of time. Uh, the only thing that's actually protecting um, the Vatican from losing its holdings is the French army. Um, Napoleon, uh, Napoleon III, not Napoleon Bonaparte, but his nephew, is ruler of France by this point, and he sends troops to Rome to protect uh, what's left of the Papal States from um, the Rudimento. Uh, Pope actually gets his own army briefly, a volunteer army actually forms itself and, send, and they send people to Rome, they're called the Zwabs, the Pontifical Zwabs, mostly French and, uh, and Dutch uh, soldiers who volunteer to go there and defend Rome against these uh, um, um, these uh, troops of Garibaldi. They actually won a battle, by the way, against them in 1867, but it's a matter of time. There's really no way uh, to sort of keep this, uh, keep this uh, going indefinitely, but it's something to keep in mind in the background of all this, because these armies, by the way, they are explicitly anti-Catholic. Not, not the Italian state, the Italian forces, the king of Italy. But Garibaldi, you give you an idea of how anti-clerical they actually are. Anybody here been to Rome, by any chance? Okay, if you go, maybe you know this, if you go up, there's a, there's a statue of Garibaldi, uh, I believe on the backside of the Lateran Palace, where he's uh, depicted in a bronze statue on a horse. Um, with the uh, back of the horse, its rear end facing the Vatican. Now, should give you an idea, there's a lot of bitterness. This hasn't gone away, by the way. It's still kind of present in the, uh, the background of Italian life. So you have all this in the background of what's going on uh, with Pius and the church in the, 18, uh, in the 1800s. So you have the foil of modernity, who Pius IX, and there were a lot of people around him who were concerned about things in Europe. You also have, uh, and I'm speaking, by the way, within the Catholic world, because Obviously, Protestants, people who are secular, don't care much for the church. But within the Catholic world, you have other people who have different ideas. And the main figure to know about here, by the name Ignaz von Doliger, and actually has several other German names. I can't remember. Johann Josef Ignaz, I can't remember what they all are, but Ignatius, that's what Ignaz is, von Doliger, um, who is a priest and a theologian uh, at the University of Munich uh, in Bavaria in Germany. And he too, you see the dates for his life, born in 1799, lived a lot longer, 1890. Uh, he is also shaped by the French Revolution. He's also shaped by the fact that um, Germany sort of becomes, uh, even before it becomes, by the way, it will become a unified state in 1871, we'll come to that in a moment. Um, he's shaped by the fact that Germany becomes a sort of intellectual center of Europe in the 19th century, in the same way that you know, France had been this intellectual center of the Enlightenment, in the 19th century, it's Germany. And the reason why, by the way, has to do with the French Revolution. Because during the French Revolution, of course, Napoleon invades Prussia, which is the major military power in, uh, in Germany. And by the way, Germany is a collection of just different states. There's a bunch of them before uh, 1870. And he defeats, routes them, actually. And this is hum deeply humiliating uh, to the Prussians. He forces a constitution on them. He overruns their capital, Berlin. Um, from that, 1806, from that time forward, they begin refounding their universities in Germany. And my point is that the changes in German education were deeply influential. It's in Germany in the early 19th century, by the way, they invent things like the PhD. There was no PhD. Before, the Germans invented it for a variety of reasons. Uh, my point in mentioning that is that you have these modern ideas being introduced, not just uh, ideas themselves, but changes in the curricula, changes in the way education is organized that will affect the Catholic Church in Germany. Uh, and Dollinger's a part of all this. But he becomes a priest uh, in the early 1820s, goes to seminary. Um, and uh, early on in his career, he is a defender of papal authority. He's a defender of the Pope's uh, primacy, his uh, doctrine of the rule of the church, and even of his infallibility. His dissertation is actually written on this in 1826. Um, He's regarded, he is, by the way, one of the more brilliant theologians of the, of the 19th century um, in Catholic, or, uh, Catholic circles, even though, as we'll see, it doesn't end up well for him in the end. Um, and he'll defend specifically, um, defend the church specifically against Protestants and their charges, again, that Catholic doctrine changed fundamentally over time, that it wasn't consistent, that it wasn't, um, again, the charge, the big church is basically making things up. 
uh, in order to keep its power, right? It's the sort of barely articulated um, sense that you get from, uh, from Dollinger. Uh, and in fact, he writes several other books later on, beginning of the 1840s, you don't even know the names of any of this. I don't have them anyway, I don't have my notes, but um, he will actually critique um, Protestants for not, for having, um, in terms of their own history, not having a development of their doctrine that is coherent or as continuous uh, as the Catholic Church. And this is one of the important things to note about Dollinger and his uh, compatriots. He has an idea of how church doctrine evolved, which is very new. Because one of the things, this is that term historicness up there, you don't even know this. Uh, I'll get to two in a second. Historicness means something like historicism. Um, and what this means is you have, um, you have this movement within German philosophy and German thinking, generally speaking, which begins to put a lot of heavy emphasis on historical reconstruction as being the sort of basis for, uh, for education. That is to say, if you're going to understand something, you have to understand that historically first. Uh, why is that important? Because if you emphasize that to its logical conclusion, and a lot of German thinkers do this, that means that everything basically is historical. Why is that important? Okay. If everything's historical, it's basically shaped by its local, its immediate historical context. And essentially what that means is there's no, there's no enduring eternal truth. Everything's just a product of its immediate historical circumstances. Dolingen never goes that far, but he is influenced by that thinking. I am as a historian. I should mention, by the way, when I talk about German universities, history was not a professional activity for the 19th century. It was done by aristocrats, you know, clergymen in the countryside with nothing better to do, uh, people who were out of power. It was an amateur sort of thing. It becomes a professional discipline um, in the 19th century. And the Germans are at the forefront of this field, uh, becomes quasi-scientific. They talk about it as a science. It's not a science. But they used what they thought were the best methods of the day to do history, and this is very important to understand, um, they thought of themselves as being experts. Dollinger thought of himself as being an expert. We'll come back to why in a moment. Uh, this will definitely influence um, schools of Catholic thought in Germany, one of which um, at the University of Tübingen is the most important, because you will have these thinkers, and he's friends with the most famous of these, and Johann uh, Adam Moller, who, uh, who discussed the church's history in terms of an organic development of its doctrine. You know, from the beginning, from the Bible, if you've ever heard that term, development of doctrine, I think it was from John Henry Newman, uh, he was familiar with these thinkers. The idea that the church, you have this revelation given in the Bible, or say the church, and it develops almost like an embryo, right? You know, an embryo has um, uh, all the material necessary to become a complete human being later on. That's sort of the basic idea that a lot of these thinkers have, and Newman never really abandons this idea. We have this doctrine, right? In the Bible it says so and so. Not everything about it is clear and explicit in the beginning. It has to develop and come to its full expression later on. Uh, it's a way of explaining, of course, changes in the church's teaching. So we don't, look at that, that, uh, that, so we don't have to assume they're just making stuff up as they go along. Um, and early in his career, Dolander defends all this. Um, however, he's going to go through a shift in his thinking by the time we get to the 1860s. Partly, and I don't have time to go through this in too much detail, partly because of his experience in politics. Because he also has a role to play in the revolutions of 1848. Um, there are revolutions, of course, in various in German countries in the 1840s. Um, in Bavaria, his kingdom, uh, they have a revolution in which they establish a Bavarian parliament. He's elected to it. Even as a priest, he's elected to it. Um, and he becomes, and again, nothing comes of this, the revolution there is put down. My point is, he becomes much more nationalistic in his thinking as we get to the 1860s for a variety of reasons. And by nationalistic, what I mean by that is, um, uh, this becomes public in the 1860s. Uh, and there's a uh, famous conference um, in Munich, in his university, in which he uh, gives a lecture on the state of Catholic theology, in which he basically says that from now on, the church's teachings, essentially, and I have I had it in the notes, a nice little phrase he'd give you, basically had to be verified by what he called scientific methods of history. That is to say, for it to be considered you know, believable, it had to be subject to, well, academic expertise like his. And in fact, by the way, the church was going through at the same time in this period a uh, renaissance of uh, scholastic thinking. You even know what scholasticism is. This is Thomas Aquinas. This is the medieval doctrine, which is very different. It doesn't start with history. It starts with philosophical concepts. Um, he derides all this as being you know, nonsense propagated by Italians. It's very, he has a very nationalistic edge to this, all, all this. 
He also began propagating, by the way, the idea that, the na that national churches, in particular the German church, um, should have an equal share in determining doctrine. Uh, more or less equal along with the Pope, even maybe more superior if they have that sort of technical expertise. Uh, and so Dobringer has changed his tune by the 1860s. He begins, by the way, publishing, even in the middle of, even before the council has um, uh, been convened, um, text critical of the papacy. He's done basically a 180 by the time you get to the 1860s. But he speaks for a lot of people who are uncomfortable, we're going to see what's going to go on uh, in the Vatican. <laughs> That brings me to uh, the Vatican Council itself. So you have preparations for this council. I mentioned uh, a while back um, that Pius IX had issued these uh, documents, the Simplice of Errors, and Quanta Cura, which is his encyclical that goes along with it, in 1864. And it's in 1864 he begins brooding the idea of calling an ecumenical council with his, with his advisors. Um, why? To combat, again, his, this is pretty consistent about his life, in some ways to combat errors, basically. Um, and so you have this beginning in his mind, at least ten, almost ten years, five to ten years, five years or so, before the council is even called. Um, I should mention, by the way, there were a lot of people who, um, to say the least, disagreed with this. Uh, not only did they not think papal infallibility needed to be defined this way, they also think that they need a council to do this. I mention this um, partly because you have people like John Henry Newman, who of course, blessed himself, someone who came to accept the council's decrees. He was against this. He thought this was a bad idea for a lot of reasons. Um, he, by the way, was friends with Dollinger, uh, as were several other leading um, Catholic uh, academics in Britain. Um, partly, by the way, because, well, they didn't think it was an opportune moment to do this. Why? Because of the political situation, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, the second reason was, and this is one of Newman's criticisms, is they didn't think there was a good enough reason to do it. Normally in the history of the church, when they call a council to define something, there's an immediate threat to a specific doctrine. And what Pius wanted to do, Pius was really responding to a whole sort of general attack on the church in many ways. Uh, and uh, Newman didn't think that was, uh, didn't think it was appropriate to do that at the time. Uh, and so you have, again, there's real difference of opinion about this. Not, by the way, about, we'll get to this in a moment, some of the other documents, there's only one of the documents they actually publish, uh, particularly about that infallibility uh, and its, uh, and its uh, viability. And so what happens is Dollinger and some of his friends go to Rome for the council once it opens. By the way, it opens in uh, December 8th, 1869, uh, at St. Peter's. And by the way, this image you see in the background is an image of the council itself, if you didn't notice, that's what that's there for. Uh, painting of it. And uh, during the council, um, Dollinger starts issuing these really, really bitter attacks on the definition of papal infallibility while the council is going on. They're collected later on called Letters from Rome, uh, which publishes anonymous, 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 anonymously, uh, as you, the pen name is Janus, in which he tries to tear it to shreds. In particular, again, he's an academic historian. He points out, and I should, we'll come back to this at the end of this, um, all the various times that popes have basically contradicted themselves. And they have, by the way. That's totally true. He knew, he knew his facts very well, actually. Um, and in fact, one of the things, we'll come back to this uh, at the end if you want to ask me about this, um, one of the real uh, big historical cases that get, that get discussed, discussed in every session of the council, every pamphlet published outside of it, uh, is, of course, the case of Pope Honorius I. If you don't know who that is, that was a pope in the 7th century who was actually condemned for heresy formally after his death, uh, but he was condemned as a heretic. That would seem to, of course, uh, raise problems for the uh, doctrine of papal uh, infallibility. And by the way, he had uh, inside information, did uh, Dolinger, on the, uh, uh, on the council itself, because he was there with Lord Acton. Uh, Lord Acton was at, uh, uh, one of his friends from Britain. If you ever heard of Lord Acton, you don't know his name. You ever heard the phrase, uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, that is him. Uh, he was uh, actually a former pupil of Dolphinger's who came to Germany to study with him. Um, he had a friend in the, uh, in the council who was feeding him information during all of this. So you had all this politics going on before this. And so, uh, in July of 18, uh, and by the way, they had a schema driven up, uh, dri uh, written up um, of topics to discuss beforehand. This was all pretty tightly controlled by Pius and his advisors. Um, they didn't have the intention, really, of letting people go in crazy directions. 
Um, and uh, what happened is, uh, by July 18, by July of 1870, they already, had already uh, voted on and passed unanimously the first dogmatic constitution of the council. This has to do with the nature of the church. I don't have the time to talk about it here, but it deals with the nature of the church, the nature of things like faith and reason, their relationship between them. It does some pretty interesting things, actually, in many ways. I mention that because there are 744 bishops present at the council. Once they get to the next section, Pastor Returnus on infallibility, all of a sudden that unanimity breaks down. Uh, there are 744 bishops. Um, some 80 begin to leave before the vote. They know which way it's going to go. Uh, the Pope tries to twist arms to get it uh, to be as uh, unanimous as possible. It doesn't really work. Uh, in the end, 434 bishops uh, vote for Pastor Returnus. Only two actually stay to vote against it. One of whom, by the way, curious little uh, anecdote, is from Little Rock, Arkansas. The Bishop of Little Rock was one of the people to vote against this. Um, doesn't say much for Arkansas, does it? Um, and so that's July 18th of 1870. The next day, July 19th, the Kingdom of France, the Empire of France, declares war on the Kingdom of Prussia. Uh, why am I telling you this? This is significant because remember, it's French troops that protect Rome from the Italians who want to take it over. The moment they do that, they have to withdraw their troops from Rome to go fight the Germans. Um, but a month late, month and a half later, on September 2nd, the French are wiped out by the Savan, by the Prussians. The war will drag on for another six months, but it's over by that point, which means the French aren't coming back, which means about three weeks later, on September 20th, Rome is taken by Italian forces. At that point, the Pope says, we really can't go on with this. A uh, month later in October, he adjourns the council permanently. It never finishes its work. It's something to come back to. Um, because they finished the constitution of the Pope's authority, they had planned to talk about the authority of bishops, the authority of the church as a whole. They never got around to it um, because of the Pro franco prussian War, uh, which led to an end to this. However, this what uh, did, did I get I spell that? Yeah, I did, I did spell declarations right. I do these things, and all of a sudden you look up there and like, oh my god. Uh, I have a PhD. You know. No, um, declarations. Um, the council was immediately a cause of consternation and controversy. We went all across Europe, to a lesser extent the United States. You have people, again, it's a Protestant country, they, they, less, of a, less of an issue here because we, didn't, we had separation of church and state. Uh, but in other countries, which are officially Protestant, it's a bigger deal. Uh, in Britain, there's a, a pamphlet war between, a pamphlet war, a pamphlet exchange, I call it a war, uh, between John Henry Newman and the uh, future, the one cent future Prime Minister, William Gladstone. The main charge, by the way, being that because popes are prepared to be infallible, they cannot be good subjects or good citizens of their countries. If they have an infallible pope there, they can't disagree with anything he says, therefore they must be essentially traitors of their country. And in fact, in 1874, there's a circular dispatch issued by the, by the German government. By the, this is, by the way, something I should have mentioned. The uh, Franco-Prussian War ended with the Germans declaring themselves. They actually, Prussia declared all of Germany, they all joined together to form a, a unified state, a German empire, the Reich. I just like saying Reich because it sounds all sinister and uh, dark Vaderish. But um, the German uh, chancellor, who was the first minister of, the, uh, of Wilhelm I of, of, uh, of Germany, issues a circular letter in which he basically says that the Pope, by declaring his infallibility, had made himself an absolute monarch, more absolute than any monarch in the world, basically. Um, you also have, at the same time, or actually just right after the council in 1871, the University of Munich, a bunch of professors, about 44 of them, kind of together. They're led by von Bollinger, and they issue a declaration basically criticizing um, the, um, the Declaration on Infallibility as being uh, completely untenable in 1871. In response to this, the Archbishop of Munich, Dollinger's, von Dollinger's, um, uh, his bishop, um, basically issues a public um, response saying he has to submit on pain of excommunication. John Dollinger writes a public letter back to him saying he cannot do this. Uh, he cannot do it as a historian. It's actually, it's kind of moving in some ways. He says he just can't do it. Uh, and the Archbishop excommunicates him uh, in 1871. At the same time, uh, remember uh, Rome has been captured by, um, by Italian forces. They make sure not to touch the Pope. There are probably some who want to, but they're not stupid. It would be bad for their cause. They did this. They have what they wanted. They have Rome as their capital now. They leave him with a few hundred acres around, also just today, the Vatican city state. 
Um, and uh, but to the end of his days, actually, Pius IX will actually call himself a prisoner of the Vatican. I mention that because both of these figures I'm uh, putting out here obviously kind of die in exile to a certain degree. Uh, Dollinger, by the way, never never recants. He dies uh, in excommunication, basically, from the church. Uh, there are numerous attempts to try to get him to come back. He will not do it. He says he simply cannot believe this. Um, there are, by the way, if you don't know, there's dissident bishops and clergy who form and who go into schism. They form the old Catholic Church, which are still around, by the way, the old Catholics. Um, they try to get Dolan to join them. He never will do that. He insists to the end that he's still a Catholic, that the excommunication was unjust, and so on and so forth. Um, and so you're left with this sort of, you know, um, uh, amazing sort of divergence between this great pope and this uh, learned uh, theologian who, uh, as I'm going to hope I show in a moment, I think he got things wrong for a very explainable reason. He did get things wrong, by the way. So that's the overview of the council. So what exactly did the council do? What does this mean for us, basically? Um, the first thing to note is that, and I kind of brushed over this in talking about Dolinger because I'm going to bore you to death. Um, part of the reason Dolinger was so, and by the way, he was really, something that really got him hot under the collar when he talked about this stuff. Um, when he writes his letters from Rome, he's not writing in a detached academic manner. It, it's pure polemic. And part of the reason why is there's a party of what's called the Ultramontane Party in 19th century, um, 19th century Europe, especially around the Pope, who want him to, wanted the Pope to push for the most extravagant definition of papal infallibility you could possibly get. Um, Ultramontane, by the way, is just a term that means beyond the mountains. It refers to German and French theologians, people from north of the Alps, who appeal to the Pope's authority. And again, coming out of the French Revolution, a lot of people in Germany, a lot of people in France, thought they needed you know, papal authority, a strong papal authority uh, to guide the church. Uh, some of these people wanted to, in fact, define, you know, sort of like what I, I, that story from Rex Matrum, they wanted to define his authority as being that sort of uh, comprehensive. Um, if they'd had their way, they probably would have had a much more comprehensive definition of what um, the Pope actually says, um, the oath, essentially. Uh, and I say this because if you read histories of the First Vatican Council, a lot of people tend to think they won for some reason in the definition. That's partly because uh, I didn't give you the definition of papal primacy. That was a pretty strong definition, by the way. Uh, it did re reiterate his right to sort of govern and rule the church in a fairly straightforward way. On the other hand, if I had the actual definition before me, I, could actually, I have to have something to, uh, to point out with this. The definition of papal infallibility is actually a lot more narrow than what the Ultramontane wanted. Um, they wanted something like, um, there was a medieval author named Giles of Rome. Do you know Giles of Rome? You don't know. Of course you don't know. Uh, you shouldn't. Uh, he was this papal apologist in the Middle Ages, he wrote a book called On Ecclesiastical Power, in which he said, and I'm not kidding, he's literal about this, that the Pope is the ruler of the entire world. Literally. Not just the church, but the entire world, all over the And the, reason, the reasoning, by the way, if you're wondering about this, um, the church is superior to the state, because the church deals with our supernatural end or with our natural end. Therefore, the church has, should have authority over the state. Pope's the ruler of the church, therefore he's the ruler of all the states, he's the ruler of the entire freaking world. I, said, I know this stuff because I have an edition of this actual book in my house for some reason, uh, and it's actually called, in the modern edition, the guy uses this term, it's the first theory of world government. And it is crazy nonsense, let me tell you. Uh, there are people at the council who wanted, basically wanted them to declare his temporal power a dogma of the faith. They didn't win, they lost out. That's the first thing to understand here is that as much as he didn't want to admit this, because Dolan I should, I should uh, defend him for a second, he was concerned the Pope would define something crazy, obviously against the historical record. I think I just spit a little, I think I just spit. Uh, the, uh, against the historical record that contradicted earlier teachings. Um, and that didn't come to pass. Uh, I'll say this, again, I think because, partly because of Pius the Ninth's personality, he's very combative, very emotional. People get this uh, idea that this, this definition is really, really free willing, it's not. I think, I'll say this, I think I, I, think I know this, I think he actually took criticisms like Von Dolinger seriously, uh, much as he didn't want to admit this. And in fact, again, I was going to sort of spring this on you, and I have it in my notes somewhere, but uh, there's another part of the definition of infallibility in the text itself in Pastor of Turner's, where I have to paraphrase this for you because I can't actually give this to you, but uh, where it says basically that this, this uh, charism of infallibility was not given to the successors of Peter's to define new doctrines. 
it was only given to them to sort of reaffirm basically what had been taught uh, from the beginning. In other words, it's essentially a, a power that's meant to sort of reaffirm the sacred tradition of the church, which actually is fairly accurate. You go back to the earliest defenses, earliest assertions of papal authority, historically speaking, in the fourth and fifth centuries, that's what they're talking about, that the Church of Rome has this pure teaching and the Pope defends it. Um, and so we basically defend, the, the council actually defines it in really, really conservative terms. And in fact, uh, and theologians have sort of refined this since then, the idea of defining something ex cathedra as opposed to, and this is a distinction one of uh, uh, a neo-scholastic uh, theologian introduces in the 19th century, um, the ordinary magisterium versus the extraordinary one. Um, what does that mean? Uh, well, ordinary magisterium is just the sort of ordinary workings, the ordinary teachings of the church, as for example, when the Pope teaches like his Wednesday audiences, which you have been to Rome, as I had the pleasure in going to see, uh, if you haven't, um, when he's teaching with his public authority, but not with his full authority, he's addressing a specific audience at a specific place at a specific time. Uh, in other words, it's not addressing the entire church, and it's not necessarily something that's meant to bind the whole church, but as long as, it's con as long as it's consistent with what has always been taught, it's still infallible. What the extraordinary magisterium is, is that ex cathedra statement of defined the pastor eternus. When he does explicitly define a doctrine for the entire church, um, with it invoking his full authority to do so, but also in the sort of solemn nature of the declaration, it cannot be some sort of like offhand comment he makes and says, oh, there you go, things are done, I can't ever look like that. Uh, it has to be very explicit about what the statement's meant to do. Long story short, all that got what a good means, they actually narrowed the range of the Pope's authority to teach infallibly very much. The base of the Pope is only really infallible under certain well-defined circumstances when he's teaching, uh, according to the First Vatican Council. Which means, by the way, that he cannot violate earlier teachings, he cannot violate natural laws, he can also not violate the laws of logic. Two plus two still equals four. And pretty much always will. Uh, he cannot violate the canons of reason, obviously. Um, one thing to note about this, by the way, sometimes you will get people and again, not just with infallibility, but with his primacy, say that Vatican II changed all this, because they say that Vatican II changed everything without much actual evidence to back them up. Um, it didn't. In fact, there's a section in the Gentium, which is the Constitution of the Church in the, in the documents of the Vatican Council. They reaffirm everything that Vatican I taught about the Pope's infallibility. They just add stuff about the, the uh, infallibility of bishops and their authority in the Church and authority to find doctrine. Um, they also um, write very eloquently of the doctrine of collegiality. That is to say, one of the, one of the um, criticisms of the Pope in 1870, after he defined this doctrine, was, well, this sounds like the Pope is just a sort of dictator over the bishops. The Second Vatican Council wanted to make sure that was not the case. The Pope only has a share, a very small share, in the infallibility granted to the church by God. He doesn't have all of it. Now, he can exercise it on his own in very rare circumstances. But he can't just do whatever the hell he wants. <laughs> uh, and I had a nice quotation from Benedict the Sixteenth to actually explain that. But it's in my notes. It was great. Let me tell you. You can read them for yourself whenever I give, send you the link to them. Um, which is to say um, that this doctrine is actually a, it's a limiting doctrine. Actually, it's meant to make sure that there are not any sort of big reverses, dare I say, paradigm shifts in the Catholic Church. Uh, and it's meant to basically reaffirm the church as a, a reaffirm um, uh, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, as the guardian of the church's sacred tradition, and not someone who can just do whatever the hell he wants, whenever the hell he wants to. And then finally, I bring this back. This is the, one, of my, actually one of my favorite passages. Um, this is, I believe, from I think it's Luke chapter 22, verse, uh, verse 30 something or whatever. Um, I mentioned the earlier verse, the biblical verse, to come back to all this. One of the reasons why the church defines doctrines like this is to make things more clear and to make, you know, to give the people who give the faithful um, rational reasons for what we believe. And um, I've always thought, again, I, I had not read the documents of Vatican, of Vatican I before I prepared for this class. I mean, I had to find them kind of providential and inspiring in some ways. They really are uh, um, a, a testament to the fact that the church wants to give, again, reasons for what it believes. Um, that line is from, uh, this is just this is the Last Supper, uh, in the version of, uh, um, in St. Luke, where he says, where Peter says, I'm going to follow you into death, and he says, no, you're going to betray me, basically, and he says, 
what is it? Satan uh, has wished to uh, wish to sift, sift you like wheat, but I pray for you that your faith may not fail. Uh, again, we have uh, Christ's prayer that Peter may not fail. Doesn't mean necessarily that he's going to be uh, not not failing every single situation. And we kind of have to make that distinction. If you want to be, I think a, a, a faithful Catholic who uses the reason. Um, and so, I do want to, did I get within? Yeah, basically, I, I did about, about forty-five minutes. That was my plan. That's not bad. That's it. <laughs> that is what I have for you. Uh, any questions I can answer for you? Things that I could clear up or uh, expatiate upon? Is that a word? Did I get that word right? Um, um, questions? Was that exciting, huh? <laughs> so did they have anything about a uh, response to the issue with Pope Honorius? Like, Not in the document itself, no. But again, the, well, maybe we explain why they didn't, or what the how it works out. Okay, the reason why. Let me explain the background to. Okay, in the seventh century, there was uh, there were still debates over the nature of Christ's divinity. So, the doctrine as defined by the Council of Nicaea was, uh, God is both true man, true God and true man. You say it in the creed every week. He has a divine nature. He has a human nature. There were people who called themselves, and this is kind of disputed today, but were people who uh, basically denied this and said when Jesus became man, he basically created this sort of one sort of super nature. Uh, they were given the term monophysite. Again, we don't want to go into this in much detail, but it was decreed to be basically a heresy to believe that sort of thing. Um, there was sort of a compromise um, constructed later on in the seventh, that's in an earlier period, in the seventh century, which is sometimes called monothelism. It basically means uh, one will. And this is, again, it's more or less the same thing, saying, okay, Christ was divine and human, but he only had one will, which is the same thing as saying he doesn't have two natures. It denies what the creed actually states. But what happened was, um, the Patriarch of Constantinople wanted to adopt, and the reason, wanted to adopt this idea, this idea of monothelism, one will uh, for Christ, because um, it was a compromise, because it was kind of, he was trying to paper over theological differences within the Byzantine Empire. And so he wrote a letter to Pope Honorius, who, by the way, was a fairly upstanding guy, known for his, you know, he had a bit of a moral life and all that stuff. Basically, and Sergius was a very political figure who kind of basically snookered, um, snookered Honorius into basically giving him his, his affirmation of this doctrine. And uh, he basically says, yes, that's probably a good thing to do. Don't really, my point is, he doesn't really either, he doesn't really come out and say, yes, that's the only doctrine. Or as one uh, author I put it when doing research for this, Honorius neither condemned nor defined anything in this letter. It basically said, yeah, go ahead and do that. In other words, he allowed this guy, gave his carte blanche to this guy for teaching heresy when he should have known better. Um, he dies in 638. Uh, he's pope from 625 to 638 is Honorius. Um, this is not mentioned because nobody knows of his letter. What happens is you have uh, an ecumenical council, uh, 681 in Constantinople, in which they condemn that doctrine officially for the last time. It's anathema, you cannot hold that doctrine, monothelism that is. And during the course of this council, somebody gets a copy of the letter that, uh, that Honorius wrote to Sergius, the patriarch of Constantinople. The Sergius was being condemned at this council. Once the letter was read at the council, uh, basically um, the uh, council said we have to condemn Honorius too, and they did. And there were papal legates there, by the way, who agreed with this. They said they made no objection, they condemned him. Um, the Pope at the time uh, confirmed this. Uh, I'm not too sure about declaring someone heretic as, after they're dead, but the doctrine was condemned, certainly, that he taught. Uh, now, how did the council get around this, basically? Very simple. With that, uh, that distinction I made between ordinary and, and extraordinary magisterium. Um, the letter to Sergius was a public act. It was him giving advice in his, his public office, but it was to a specific person on a specific question. That is to say, he was not solemnly defining anything for the entire church. Uh, he was not addressing the entire church. That is to say, he was not an ex cathedra statement where he invoked his full authority. Um, and yes, that's splitting hairs. Because there are other instances, by the way. There's one of the major one of Pope's teaching error in the Middle Ages. Um, John XXII, um, it's a little different case. This is in the 1300s. He taught something, um, the, this had to do with the, the, the vision of the blessed after you die. This is the idea that saints, when they die, immediately go to heaven and enjoy the vision of God they're supposed to enjoy without having, I guess, passed through the last judgment. Uh, he denied this. 
um, and sermons. That's all I did. He made sermons as Pope where he actually updated this idea. Uh, eventually, theologians um, the University of Paris, other places, convinced him this was the wrong idea. He recanted before he died. Uh, but the, the doctrine had not been uh, solemnly affirmed or solemnly defined until after his death. So the difference with Honorius is that it had already been defined by a council and was denied. He was, again, at least allowing that to be taught. That's one thing to note about ex cathedra statements. They are only negative. That is to say, the Pope's infallibility is not that um, he will always get some question right and he will always teach positively what's right, but he will never teach serious error when he defines something in, in, uh, in his, using his extraordinary magisterium. Uh, it's essentially a negative, basically. You won't teach serious error uh, when he does that. Again, very narrow definition. That's how. That's what they did. And again, you could, by the way, if you're going to be off cynical, they were defining this after the fact and all this other stuff. But again, the way I see it is they were taking into account real criticisms. Without, by the way, just one other thing to note about this, um, you know, part of the reason Dolinger is so up in arms about this is he's, in, you know, I mentioned his expertise. Uh, he says at one point, oh, this is the quote I was trying to give you, that I, I forgot what it is. He says basically that um, mistakes of a scientific nature, he means mistakes about history, have to be corrected by scientific methods. I know that sounds completely boring and meaningless to you, but let me explain why that's meaningful. What he's basically saying, if he's correct, is that, well, mistakes like this have to be corrected by human reason and academic expertise. Well, if that's the case, it can't be divine revelation then. If it's really subject to human reason in that way, human methods, what, what do you need the supernatural for? You wouldn't. But you need it. What's that? You can say if your reasoning is wrong, then okay, you can uh, by reason uh, affect change to our thinking. But what created that reason in the first place? Yeah, well, that's the thing is he's, I don't think he understands the implications of what he's saying. I really don't, or did. Uh, my point, just to come back to the, the historical, when I was talking about the, the background, okay, you have all these, these uh, political movements, right? You want to throw off kings and popes. You have to understand something. There's a whole new class of what you might call intelligentsia in 19th century Europe. Um, you know, journalists, people who are educated, who, you know, have, now they have the ability to govern themselves. They really hate the idea that anybody's telling them what to do. And you're laughing, but it's actually a serious thing. Uh, these middle class people with, you know, academic degrees, you know, bureaucrats, civil servants, who are well trained. Uh, there's no doubt, by the way, Dolger was one of the best historians in the Catholic Church in the 19th century, it's not a question. Um, the problem was, of course, he didn't want to have to submit to people he didn't essentially respect. Uh, but again, this is, you know, you cannot have a magisterium of academics. It would mean the end of any sort of, it would be, be no difference between the natural and the supernatural anymore. I think that's what kind of Pius IX understood that he didn't. Uh, even if, again, sometimes your popes, they're not that impressive. <laughs> Often, they're not that impressive. You were lucky to have Benedict XVI, Benedict XVI John Paul II. Uh, most popes aren't, aren't that intellectually or that charismatically. Is that a word? It's not a word. They aren't that charismatic, let's put it that way. Most of them are kind of like you and me. And that's kind of the point. Um, God doesn't necessarily work with the best of the brightest. Um, thankfully. Actually, um, uh, and how it works to sort of you know keep that uh, uh, keep that uh, defined faith going. Sorry, I didn't mean to talk over anybody. Did they answer your question, by the way, Matt? Yeah. Essentially, that's how they got. That's how they basically reasoned that it was like, yeah, this like, was not. A it accident. wasn't an ex cathedra statement. Nope. Yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, when you think about it, it's weird. They basically um, basically said he was he was a heretic because he didn't invoke his authority. If you think yeah, about by it. By omission. By omission, yeah. If he, if he taught what he was supposed to teach, which is, that's, you know, and it sounds, again, if you were someone who says, well, if you can't define anything new, what do you need the power for anyway? Well, the answer should be obvious. We know what's right to do a lot of times. We just don't want to do it. <laughs> uh, you have people there to, to remind you what it is. Again, nobody likes to hear that. That is kind of what the Pope's there to do, basically. Tell you things you can't, I hate to put it in those terms, but tell you what your limits are. Uh, of course, again, um, uh, and he, by the way, and I should have mentioned this about Vatican II, um, and Pius IX, actually, a uh, long story, Pius IX acknowledged later on that the Pope had plenty of limits, that there was, in fact, a divine, if you like, constitution to the church, um, and the Pope's literally not, he's like, if you want to see him as a monarch, he's a constitutional monarch, uh, and unlike actual, like, um, uh, politicians, he can't mess with that constitution, 
Uh, that's essentially where this, uh, where I think they end up with in the council. Uh, any other questions? Yes, ma'am, Becky. Um, was, so, does people infallibility, people infallibility extend to encyclical? Was the syllabus of errors True. in encyclical? And have you ever heard that stuff that was condemned, if people infallibility sure. is such that it can define negative, like saying that is an error, sure. then have you heard that some of the things in the syllabus have been contradicted? Some yeah. Documents in Vatican II, sure, it's a good question, yeah. Like because of course in Vatican II you had the Declaration on Religious Freedom, and this is usually a point of um, contention. Uh, it's still a big point of contention, actually. Uh, a couple of things. One is that there, are, when you look at papal documents, or any documents, but council documents, one thing is that the, the more general the statement, the more gen generic, the more, the more universal the statement, tends to be they had the more authority. And it's pretty clear Pius IX is addressing like his contemporary situation, I'll say that. Uh, I don't know that's the best way to, I'm, I'm not a theologian, so I couldn't tell you, I'm, I'm giving you second hand. I, I, I usually begin these talks by explaining, <laughs> I'm not a theological expert, expert. historical, sort of. Uh, but um, the, the debate there goes to, okay, did the church ever definitively teach this as a, um, uh, as a doctrine that, yes, religious freedom, as we define it in the modern world, is it uh, a sin or whatever? Um, and as far as I can tell, again, there hasn't been a lot of um, there's been a lot of debate about it. The church itself has never has not simply had, has simply not bothered to define more clearly what it means. It probably needs to, because on the one hand, you have you do have assertions like the syllabus, in which, uh, and by the way, the rationale for Pius the Ninth, why he wanted to say that was, well, if this is a true faith, why should any other faith be publicly supported? It's, there's a natural logic there. Um, there are ways to sort of to, to sort of um, Interpret that where it's not discontinuous with the past. There's not been any sort of attempt to do that. They're going to have to because it looks like when you first look at it, like this looks like a total reversal. It's not as big a it's not really a reversal, big a reversal as you think uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, but again, a lot of times these documents, when they are dealing in these universal concepts, they don't they don't get very specific because they're just trying to define general things. Um, personally, I don't think the church ever taught. To me, that's when you're talking about vis-a-vis like, -vis other religious groups. To me, that's more of a policy and a dogma. I don't know if we ever actually said, like, you know, first of all, as long as you assume, yeah, this is the true faith, you're trying to convert everybody. Yeah, you, you can, yeah, you're supposed to live in, like, peace, you know, and, and not be violent or whatever. Um, uh, in terms of, like, religious freedom, if you're saying, put it this way, if you say religious freedom is a permanent state because all religions are equal, yeah, that's wrong. <laughs> we can't say that. No. If you're saying, yes, this is acceptable as a, you know, look, we have to live in the world, maybe this way for, as long as you don't say it's a permanent thing, I think that, I don't think there's much, actually much problem with that. Um, it may be, the time, again, from time to time, obviously in the West, we have to deal with that. Um, it gets more of a problematic, because there are some people who tend to act like, sometimes talk like, sometimes, by the way, members of the actual hierarchy, like, hey, they're all basically, blah, 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 you can't. No, sorry. Uh, if you don't believe it's the right one, why bother? Okay. I'm mean, getting you know, into the thing, but my point is, yeah, it, it's problematic. It's not insurmountable, let's put it that way. But yes, it is a, it is a flashpoint for discussions like this, certainly. Uh, I don't have to keep you guys here. It's not actually, you know, this is not getting the grade for this. You guys don't have to stay uh, any longer if you don't want to, but. Uh, Yes, it was very nice, by the way, to see so many faces this time. <laughs> so I thank you all for if there's another question, you can ask me after the thing's over. But thank you all for coming. I uh, hope I'll see you next time. Um, yeah, have a good month, hopefully. Yeah, you can turn that on if you want.